I'll be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be watching uh, from today, welcome. Um, thank you to all of those of you who are able to join us this evening um, during our lung cancer living room. For those of you who may not know me, I'm Danielle Hicks. I am Chief Patient Officer here at GoTo Foundation for Lung Cancer. And for those who maybe aren't veterans to the lung cancer living room and maybe new, um, just so you know, a little heads up up front, this is a support and education series uh, created specifically with patients and caregivers in mind, with the goal really of bringing to you live and in, in real time educational talks from key opinion leaders um, in the lung cancer community. I'm happy to say that this evening we have Dr. Ross Kamage, who is an MD, PhD, professor of medicine and oncology at the Joyce Zeff Chair and the Joyce Zeff Chair in Lung Cancer Research at the University of Colorado. I've known Dr. Kamage for a long time. He is definitely a veteran to the lung cancer living room. We couldn't be uh, more thrilled to have him back with us tonight. Tonight, we're going to be talking about targeted therapies and their role in treating lung cancer. And I know this is a topic that comes up frequently, but it's also a topic um, where things are changing frequently. So I'm really excited to, uh, like I said, have Dr. Kamich here to talk about uh, what they are, um, how you find out if you have one, and what to do if you find out you do. Uh, but before we get into really the meat of targeted therapies and what they are. I want to step back a little bit and start with um, a little bit of the background on the diagnostic process and how someone goes or comes to determine whether or not they may even have a biomarker that um, has an appropriate uh, or federally approved targeted therapy. So let's start maybe with biopsies. A person's diagnosed or there's a suspicion, a, a, a spot or a lesion, if you will, is found. What, what sort of happens next? Well, so, I mean, you can enter the, the sort of the, the barrel of the gun that will eventually lead to your diagnosis of lung cancer in a number of different ways. Usually, you've got some kind of a symptom. Sometimes you, you might have something incidental found on a scan or a chest x-ray that you had done for other reasons. But let's assume the most common one. You know, you have a symptom, a cough or shortness of breath or, or pain or something. And they do some investigations and they say, uh oh, there's something there that shouldn't be there the the field, you know, or what's going to go on in your life is going to go in a couple of different directions, partly in parallel. One is somebody's going to say, hey, I'm a little worried this might be a cancer. So let's just see where it might have come from and where it might be. So they have what's called staging investigations. For lung cancer, that usually, you know, you go from a chest x-ray to a CT scan, to a PET scan, to an MRI of your brain. And then somewhere along the way, you go, okay, so I can see a lump in the lung, but that doesn't mean it's a lung cancer. It could have come from somewhere else. So you've got to get a biopsy. And what they biopsy depends on what's accessible. So if it's in your lungs, it might be a bronchoscopy. If there's a, a thing sitting on the end of your nose, you'll, you know, you'll have a needle biopsy there. If it's in your liver, you'll have a biopsy there. But somehow tissue is going to get under a microscope. A pathology is going to go, this looks like a lung cancer. And that's kind of where we were up to 20 years ago. And now what's changed is it's not just about what it looks like down the microscope. It's what's hiding within those cells. And that's where these molecular tests have come about to say, look, these three lung cancers all look the same down the microscope, but this one has this specific thing that went wrong in it. This one has this one. And they behave differently and they can be treated differently. One of the things I just want to clarify for those who may be watching is you're going to hear us use the word, or me, um, Ross may use a different word, and you may hear even a different word from your own healthcare team about what this testing actually looks like once a diagnosis of lung cancer has been made. And, and we typically refer to it in what we like to call comprehensive biomarker testing. It's also known as molecular testing, genetic testing. It kind of runs the gamut, but we're generally talking about the same, the same thing. So let me ask so, you a question, Ross. Can, can I just jump in there because you know, hey, this is what we're going to do. So I've always, I've, I've always had an issue with the term comprehensive molecular testing because it sounds like a buzzword. So I mean, uh, what, so so the 
Yes. On the on the thing is, you want to see if you have a mutation, and therefore, if you do a test and it's negative, you've got to keep looking. But if you hit pay dirt just with the first test you pick, that might be an inefficient way to do it. But you don't then need comprehensive testing. So, you know, you just need to win the lottery once. Just because you won it once, you don't need to then go buy another thousand tickets. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. I think one of the challenges I think a lot of patients and caregivers that we talk to face is there are places in this country, particularly in some maybe more rural areas where they still do single gene testing, right? And for someone who needs answers today, sometimes yeah. that can take a lot longer if they're only doing them in these one-off sort of ways. So if at all, it can be done that you can, and we're going to jump into what some of these biomarkers um, uh, or mutations are, uh, but if you can run a panel on all of at least the known ones, um, is that not sort of a best case scenario? Yeah. So, let, so, let, so I would say you need molecular testing and the best way to make the most efficient use of the biopsy you've got and time is to do a broad based panel from the start. But if that didn't happen for you and somebody says, well, you have an EGFR mutation or an out rearrangement, and they didn't do comprehensive molecular testing. You don't have to go back and do that because you've already got your answer. And that's what we 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 kind of hear quite often as um, most, if not all, of these biomarkers or mutations are mutually exclusive on, of another. So if you have an EGFR, it's highly unlikely that you have also one of the other mutations. Yeah, and where I mean, where it really comes at its own, and maybe we'll get into this, is you know somebody comes to see me. And especially if they have a very little or no smoking history or they're young and they've been told, I don't have a biomarker. I don't have a molecular test result that was positive. The first thing I'm going to go is go drill down into the details and say, well, what didn't they test you for? And sometimes we can pull these rabbits out of a hat that are super rare, but you know, you have to look for them. So technically speaking today, Tissue, as you described um, in a biopsy and grabbing a, a tissue sample, is still sort of state of the art um, standard of care best practices. But there is also blood based testing. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about the differences and when you might use one or the other or both? Yeah. So to make the diagnosis of lung cancer, you actually have to have a tissue diagnosis. So that's what look, looks like in the microscope. And that's, you know, the label that goes on your insurance and everything, and you can get all the stuff done. But the molecular testing we just talked about, because it's in the DNA, yes, you can extract that DNA from that tissue biopsy, from the tumor tissue biopsy, but sometimes it's released it into the blood and you can find at least that molecular information in the blood. Now, again, it's just like we talked about comprehensive testing. If you find something, you believe it. If you don't see something, it, it's got two issues. One is, you know, you know, was it included in the testing? But the other one is the sensitivity of the blood test is actually relatively low. So it could still be a common mutation, but it's just, there's not enough in your blood to do it. So finding it in the blood, great, you've got your answer. You don't need to go look elsewhere. If you don't find it in the blood, you've got to go to the tissue because it's not enough to truly call that a negative. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's, that it's not there. Understood. Yeah, so here's, here's, here's the analogy. So if you go fishing, I am not a fisherman, but if you go fishing and you pull a fish out of the pond, you know there are fish in there. If you don't pull a fish out of the pond, it doesn't mean there aren't any fish in there. That's a fantastic analogy, actually. I'm probably going to steal it from you. I like it a lot. Yes, yes. So now that we've identified the sort of the process and we know that there are these things called biomarkers, you talked a little bit about what they are. Can you... There are things that we didn't know 20 years ago, even a lot of things 15 years ago, a lot of things, you know, even sh shorter ago than that. These are things that are sort of driving the cancer or you alluded to. It's what's making the cancer kind of hit the gas pedal and move forward. Can you talk about what what these mutations are, what they w w what they mean to anybody's specific cancer? So for a, a long time, I think people thought that lung cancer was just this horrendous, you know, chaotic storm of stuff going on. And it was too complex. It was too heterogeneous. It was too different between people for anyone to really understand it. And yet, for some people with lung cancer, 
they have a relatively simple cat. So only one thing has gone wrong. And they have these changes, they tend to fall into three categories, mutations, gene rearrangements, and something called gene amplifications. Um, and they're not equally frequent. And when we start to talk about words like mutation, I should point out that the patient isn't mutant. These are not inherited things. This is the cancer cells are mutant. And that specific change somehow, you know, got the on button stuck in the wrong position. And that's what's driving the cancer. And the, the point being that if you can identify that, then you, you, you know, you know how to control the cancer. If you can figure out how to turn that switch back on, or at least sort of, you know, dim it down a little bit. And so the big changes over the last 20 years has been an expanding list of two things. So one is being able to look for and find these things in an increasing number of people. And secondly, having the tools, having found them that can reduce the signaling coming from these activated, relatively simple changes in some people's cancers. And it really is, I just want to point out game changing and so important. Um, to know sort of what is driving your cancer because these drugs um, that have been developed and approved to target these mutations typically work exceptionally well if you know what's driving the cancer. You know, we, we talked about 20 years ago and, and even, you know, I know most of you out there know that Bonnie is my mom and when she was diagnosed, um, the EGFR was still in clinical trials, right? So they were still kind of looking at that first sort of what seems to be now sort of the grandfather of the big mutation sort of explosion um, over the last 20 years. But it's why it's so, so important. So when, when you start to think about, you know, what would you want to look for in an ideal world? So, you know, you wouldn't want to go A, yes, no. Okay, now I'll do test B, yes, no, because that's a waste of time and you have to use tissue each time. I think we're looking to try and do everything from the get go. Tell me when something's positive. Um, and that list expands. There are now, I can't remember the math in my head, but it's about 10 different molecular changes identifiable in lung cancer that already have a targeted therapy available. And then there's a whole bunch of other ones which nobody, either nobody's made a drug for or there's a drug for it, but it's not specifically licensed for that. And so you can find these other things. Um, the other thing I, I want to, just expand on one thing. So I said at the beginning, I said, particularly if you were never a light smoker or you were young, and that's true. Most of these molecular changes tend to occur in those people, but we should not engage in prejudices too much because you can be 95 years old and a smoke for 20 years or 60 years, and you can still sometimes find these things. It's just that the hit rate is less. So everybody should be tested. That's wonderful. And it brings up a really great question about the who should be tested and you're saying everybody and we know that lung cancer has two you know there are some other kind of rare lung cancers but the two main types of lung cancer non-small cell and small cell um yeah. should everyone in those two sort of buckets if you will of lung cancer receive this type of testing so, um, so non-small cell absolutely indeed indeed there were there, there was a debate that within non-small cell there are two big buckets there. One is squamous lung cancer. And the other is everything else, which was called non-squamous, which included things like large cell, adenocarcinoma, not otherwise specified. And for a long time, people sort of said, well, again, because of the hit rate, the bang for your buck was more if you just looked in non-squamous. I think there's been a drift to say, look, the testing is getting easier and cheaper. Why wouldn't you look in a squamous, especially if it was an atypical squamous? Again, squamous tends to be associated with a heavier smoking history. But, you know, the, these aren't exceptions. They just change the frequency of that in MLTs. The other thing is that definition of squamous or non-squamous is made by a human being who is looking down the microscope. And they're as fallible as every other human being. And so I think, at least as far as I can remember, I've pushed to say, do not decide when to do an objective molecular test based on a subjective histological determination. That said, small cell currently does not have a real role for molecular testing. Again, with the exception that you are a never smoker who has small cell, and that's just so fantastically rare. You just need to look for everything there. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the, and not that I want to jump into the whole clinical trial place right now, but it, the data is only as good as what you're looking at, right? Or what you're looking for. So to your point, the adeno versus squamous and, 
is is this could or could this be a case of historically speaking up until fairly recently anyway the squamous were tested less that we just don't know and whether or not they're the same types of mutations that we see in, in, in an adeno, could there be something different in squamous? We just don't happen to be looking for it. Unless you can tell me there's a group that has a 0% chance of something, why wouldn't I test it? Unless, unless that money's coming out of my own pocket and there's only so much money. I get I get that in some healthcare systems. I'll, get, I'll give you an example. So, um, so EGFR mutations, we mentioned those, um, run about 10 to 15% of the Western population with non-squamous lung cancer, maybe as high as 40 or 60% of the East Asian population with non-small cell lung cancer. But in squamous cancer, that's only about one or 2%. And so I, you know, used to have these conversations with colleagues and they would go, well, why would, why would I get out of bed for that? And you go, well, do you test for ROS1 rearrangements, which is a rare subtype in non-squamous? And they go, of course. And you go, well, what's the frequency? They go, well, it's like one or 2%. It's like, <laughs> like, I mean, you can do whatever you like in medicine, as long as you're logically consistent. Yeah. Yeah, point made. I'm sure. I'm sure. Point made. Um, so we didn't actually we, have that. Voice, but it's funnier when I do the voice. <laughs> I do love the voice. It is funnier. Um, so we know that there are um, um, drugs that we've talked about. These targeted therapies that are directly associated with certain uh, biomarkers that may be driving your cancer. So what do we mean when we say, how do targeted therapies work? What do, what do we mean when we talk about targeted therapies? So generally speaking, uh, most of these things which are driving a cancer introduce signaling inside the cell. So cells are kind of, you know, they, they sit there and they wait for instructions. They're kind of fairly inert. And then when they get stimulated, they decide today is the day that I'm going to grow and divide and spread and do all those things. But they need they need a, a stimulus to do that. These mutations and gene rearrangements tend to cluster in molecules in the cells whose normal job is to be the arbitrator of when that stimulus occurs. And so they get stuck in the on position without any any need for anyone else whispering to them. And the way targeted therapies work is they essentially bind to the activated form of the signaling molecule and stop it signaling. Um, so when we're looking at these mutations, and you touched on this a little bit earlier, they are sort of, in some instances, your body's own immune systems miss, I guess, if you will, in allowing what might, should have been um, a cell that was destroyed or caught by your immune system, but allowed to kind of go go rogue and, and develop. Are, are we close or do you see in the future of lung cancer being able to identify maybe an inherited gene such as they have in breast cancer? Oh, that predisposes you to getting these things? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we do have like two examples of that, mm -hmm. but they're super rare. So one is you know, and this is just going to annoy all those people who are never smokers, but there are inherited mutations in the nicotine receptor that are associated with lung cancer. And we think all that does is it influences somebody's ability to get addicted and their their tendency to smoke more or less. So they're, they would sort of discover it in Eastern Europe or somewhere in Europe. And they're, they're not terribly relevant. The other one is there are some super rare people who have an, actually an inherited EGFR mutation, but it's not the one that actually drives their cancer because otherwise they'd just be a little ball of cells. They wouldn't be able to turn into a person. What they actually have inherited is this very weak secondary EGFR mutation, which sometimes emerges as a mechanism of resistance in, in people with the normal EGFR mutation. But what they've kind of like, they've already got one foot you know, in, in, the, in the pond and so they, you know, when they get that second mutation, it sort of pushes them over. But those are super rare. So no, these are considered somewhat arbitrary events that just happen to you. I'm curious, and, and it's for somewhat selfish reasons, and not only myself, but for many of folks that I've talked to over the last, you know, 16 years I've been talking to people. I know that in my particular instance, and it was it's all on my my the maternal side of my family and my mom's maternal side. So her grandfather, her mother, her aunt, her uncle, and then she 
all kind of stemming down on this one side of the family tree all developed and unfortunately all but my mom, not unfortunately, fortunately, my mom's still here, but they yeah. all succumbed to the disease. Um, and it, so it's sort of curious to me, like it's all on the same sort of, you know, yeah. branch. I mean, it may be like breast cancer in the sense that, you know, some people just get it and it's spontaneous yeah. and there may yeah. be some inherited predisposition that we don't fully understand. So let me give you two examples. So one is, um, you know, we we both know Jill Feldman, who's you know one of the one of the ex presidents of Longevity, and then one of the founders of the EGFR Resistors. So she and she wouldn't mind me telling you this, you know, has a very strong family history, and um, and she was kind of almost waiting for it to come find her, and then eventually it did. And fortunately, it's an EGFR mutation, and she's doing okay. But the other one, the other kind of obvious thing that something genetic on a m more global scale has to, is, you know, why why does the EGFR mutation rate, I said it was like 10% in the West, and why is it like 40% in the East? So this is my theory, which, you know, I have a very um, well-known basic scientist who says I'm completely wrong on this, but I'm still going to tell you my theory. So <laughs> I, I, I believe that, you know, our, our ability to generate these mutations just happens all the time. You know, you go out in the sun, you know, just stuff is around, there's air pollution, but it's when it persists, when it kind of isn't caught by your immune system, that's when it can turn into a cancer. And so my theory is different racial makeups have different blind spots in their immune system. And that there's more likely to be a blind spot for an EGFR mutation if you're Asian than if you're Caucasian. And therefore, you know, when those mutations happen to land in the EGFR, they persist more if you're an Asian. See, and something like that makes, that theory makes perfect sense to me, although I would love to hear your colleague's argument for why you're absolutely wrong. Well, he gave a very complex <laughs> argument and just told me I was an idiot, and that's just fine, but he's much not a <laughs> okay. So we, are, we have questions kind of piling up here, and um, as, as Ross had sort of mentioned, you know, earlier, there are many um, mutations that have been I identified. We talked about EGFR. I think you mentioned ROS1, ALK maybe. There's BRAF, MET, NTRAC, KRAS in the G12C, which is a fairly recent and big, big sort of um, um, discovery most recently. Um, the first question is, I think Dr. Kamage knows a lot about MET exon 14 skipping with amplification. Uh, do you have any news on this? Yes, jump rope. Yes. So, um, you know, MET, M-E-T in capital letters, um, is, is a recurrent theme. Uh, it is a signaling molecule and it can be turned on by multiple different ways. Um, you can get gene rearrangements with MET. They're super rare, but you know, you can inhibit them with MET inhibitors. But a few years ago, these things called MET X114 skip mutations were discovered and they, they're activated in a very unique way. So every, every gene makes a protein, the protein is made, and then it goes and does its job and it has an expiry date. And then your cell goes, okay, time to clean out the fridge and throws it away. So there's a little bit that is edited out in the MET exon 14 skip mutation. It's the piece of the protein which is coded for by exon 14, and that's the expiry date of the protein. So it just hangs around longer. And as it sort of clusters together, it starts going, hey guys, let's just do this all by ourselves. And it starts signaling by itself. The interesting thing about MET exon 14 is, again, it breaks some of those rules. So 50% of people with a MET exon 14 skip mutation have a smoking history. And the average age of people with MEDX on 14 is usually way older, like 70s and 80s. So, you know, again, these are averages. You can be young and get it, but, um, you know, it's expanding the pool of people who have it. And you give MET inhibitors and it can work. The challenge with those is the MET inhibitors have somewhat nasty side effects of producing a lot of swelling and edema. The next is um, my daughter had biomarker testing and was told she had ALK. She started on electinib but had major progression after one year. Further testing through the spacewalk program showed she had a mutation that didn't respond well to electinib. I believe it's a 1202 mutation, but not sure. Wouldn't it be better to look for all mutations first? I think one of, one of the best ways to think about likely targeted therapy in lung cancer is to start to think about your cancer at in the way you might if you're an evolutionary biologist. And what I mean by that is 
when you walk through the door, you just have the one change. But then you go on a treatment and you're essentially changing the environment. You're changing that environment to be nasty to the cancer. And so it dwindles away. But as soon as you start to do it, you know, the cancer is trying to generate diversity like those finches on the Galapagos Islands. And over time, you select out a variant which is different from what you started that can prosper in that environment. So the example of this lady's daughter, she didn't have that mutation, which was probably called G1202R when she walked through the door. She goes on electinib, but in the environment of the electinib, a tiny subpopulation of those cancer cells that happened to pop out G1202R the next day could then survive. And over time, that would have been enriched in the population. And so if you'd look for it at the beginning, you wouldn't have found it, but it would become the dominant form in the environment of the drug. And then the great thing is there, there are drugs that actually work on G1202R now. So hopefully she's on that. That's wonderful. And I think it's a it's a really it's it's a really important maybe to kind of hit the pause button yet again here and talk about the importance of rebiopsy at progression right to figure out you know if alk was what was originally driving the bus and you've got this really great drug that can target it something clearly has changed if now the cancer is continuing to grow and metastasize or or spread at what point in your opinion is it appropriate to do these re-biopsies? Is it right at progression? Does it depend on how much the cancer has maybe spread or metastasized? So that's a great question. So let me let me try and structure it in a, in a slightly different way. So if you walk through the door and the doctor says, great, we have the molecular result, you've got this, I'm going to put you on this target therapy, and your cancer does not respond at all. So your very first scan shows that things are growing rather than shrinking. The first thing you've got to do there is doubt the accuracy of the initial diagnostic, because these drugs are usually so effective, particularly for the ALK and the EGFR and the ROS1, you know, 80 odd percent of people are responding normally. If you're not responding, you say, well, did they screw up the diagnosis? That's separate from you respond beautifully, time goes by, and at some point something starts to grow. Now, well, I'll do the rebiopsy first, and then I'll do a little nuance on that. So yeah. at that point, it's not absolutely, you can either do a blood-based or a tissue-based biopsy. And what you're trying to figure out there is, can you figure out how the cancer has changed? Now, I think where the field is going to mature is to recognize that it's a rookie mistake to just assume that you just need to the next drug in the series that targets the same thing. So the example we had was somebody with ALK, goes on an ALK inhibitor, then develops resistance. They have a mutation, a new mutation in ALK, and now they need a different ALK inhibitor. That's great. That's called on-target resistance. But about 50% of people, and, and, and an increasing proportion as we get better drugs coming up front, will only be able to squirm out of control from the initial drug by bringing in a completely separate pathway. And not surprisingly, it's the same list of things that can drive a cancer all by themselves. So anyone that can be a, you know, uh, you know best lead actor can also be a best supporting actor. And so those statements that we had at the beginning, these things are mutually exclusive, gets completely thrown out of the window when you talk about acquired resistance. So you can be ALK, but then at acquired resistance, you can have a KRAS mutation or an EGFR mutation or MET amplification or anything. And there aren't many, you know, people routinely go, oh, you just need to go on the next ALK inhibitor trial. But that not, may not be the right thing for you unless you know your mechanism resistance. Okay, I said there was a nuance I was going to do. Yeah. At acquired resistance, apart from the biopsy, one of the things we learned probably from the ALK field is that, you know, in, in, in oncology, it was kind of like you go on the treatment, it stops working, you know, panic, everything's growing. But what we discovered is because this is a this is a clonal event, this is the evolution going on, 99% of your cancer can still be suppressed on that drug and only a little bit is growing. And so we invented this term called oligoprogression, I think in about 2012. And the idea being that, look at the scan. If 99% is still suppressed, stay on the same drug and just do something about that one spot. Maybe you just zap it with radiotherapy or cut it out. And when we do that, people tend to double the length of time they're actually on the initial drug. So meaning that, just to reiterate and make sure that, that folks understand, if the, the progression is limited to... Yeah a small spot that that could very well mean that the drug is still working in the majority of your cancer just for whatever reason has stopped working there so you would spot treat it if you will 
with something else. Yeah, so, so, so the analogy, which probably reflects my British roots, is a weed in the garden, you know, and so you don't, you don't have to throw the weed killer away. You just need to pluck the weed up and keep going. That makes perfect sense. What do you think about the use of TKIs after concurrent chemo radiation in stage 3B patients? If used as maintenance, should it be used indefinitely? Well, yeah, so I, I mean, you could, we could have the same discussion about after surgery for earlier stage cancer. Mm -hmm. So I, I think this is a, this is a fascinating time in oncology, partly because I think we are changing the way we think about things. So the traditional use of therapy given after potentially curative therapy. So chemo therapy potentially could cure a stage three patient. Surgery could potentially cure a stage one or two lung cancer patient. And when we give treatment afterwards, so-called adjuvant, because it's an adjunct to the surgery, its goal was to have a short course stop and somehow take people who weren't cured and nudge them into the cured realm. So, you know, you did everything you could. The data that has been shown only really for EGFR um, has really shaken that up. So they gave people after surgery, so I'll get to the chemo radiotherapy in a second, but after surgery, they gave them three years of a drug called osimertinib, which is an EGFR inhibitor or placebo. And they did the analysis after about, you know, a year and a half when 60% of people are still actually on the osimertinib. And they said, look, it's amazing. You know, there are far fewer people have relapsed and you go, well, but you're still on the drug. That's just telling you the drug works. It doesn't yeah. tell you anything about if you stop the drug, will you be cured? And my personal belief is it will not change the cure rate. It will suppress microscopic disease whilst you're on it. And when you stop it, if you're not already cured by the surgery, it will eventually come back. But that may not be without value even of itself. So if I said, Danielle, would you like to pay your taxes in five years time or now? You go, you sign me up for five years, okay? So I start to think about this, this adjuvant therapy, if it's a defined course, as kind of like an oncology time machine that you climb in and you say, I'm gonna deal with this in five years time and who knows what medicine's gonna be like in five years time. And I say five years because it's three years on the pill and then it takes about two years to relapse afterwards. And so I kind of like the idea of like, look, five years ago, we were things totally different, just like suppress it and we'll deal with it later. So I, th I think that's what it is. The issue with a stage three is similar to that, especially if somebody says you're gonna go on the, I mean, it's not licensed in that setting, but if somebody said you're gonna go on it with a defined exit point, you need to know that the time clock for you relapsing essentially has to start when you stop the TKI in terms of the intensity of your surveillance. You know, don't go, well, I'm three years out, therefore I don't need scans very often because I've done great. As soon as you stop that TKI, if there's still stuff left behind, you know, you have to have the same intensity you would be as if you just had surgery or finished the radiation that morning. Historically, if someone was given adjuvant therapy, it was either chemotherapy or in some cases, immunotherapy, right? So yeah. it, is it a similar scenario that you just kind of laid out with the targeted therapy? Like chemo absolutely changes the cure rate by one in 20. So there's one in 20 people who are not cured just by the surgery who they're like the floating voters and you switch them from not cured to cured by giving a course of chemo. And the most recent one is adjuvant immunotherapy for about a year. And that also seems to, I mean, we don't have the long-term data, but I, at least when they did their analysis, most of the people were actually off the therapy. So it's much better than the, the osimertinib trial that was presented. And so I believe that probably again, will change the true cure rate Gotcha. The only and the only carbon therapy is licensed is is for EGFR, and the issue yeah. is the only data they've shown is what's called disease free survival. So that's you know has your cancer come back or not, not whether you, not whether you live or not. And then it's very immature in its analysis with most people actually on the drug when they did it. So that's what I was going to say. So insofar as what we know now, this yeah. is sort of your your opinion, but that could very well change once we do have yeah, some I mean, of that long. I mean, when I, say, when I said it's about changing the way we think, so initially the purists were like, well, you haven't shown an overall survival advantage, we shouldn't do this. And, and, I, and, and it's true, I get somewhat upset by um, people who say, well, this will absolutely turn into an overall survival advantage. 
And, and you go, well, you can't say that. But I think you can still look at the data you have. And if you think about the science, you can still say there may be value in it. But it's, it's about phrasing it not in this Pollyanna kind of like, hey, if I analyze people when they're still on the pill, therefore it means that being off the pill is going to be okay too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I think, you know, even kind of pointing back and looking at how targeted therapies have been used since they have been approved, there is always that, like, I know people, folks who have been on their very first TKI and they're still on it 10 years later, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, sort of either NED or progression free, which brings me to some of the questions that have come up in here. Is there ever a time to stop a targeted therapy and see what happens? So if you, we need to go back to that stage three chemo radiotherapy example at some point. So if, if you had the, had an earlier stage cancer such that you might have been cured, then at some point you might bite the bullet and say, okay, well, I'm going to stop it and see whether I am or not with close surveillance. Um, I think for a stage four patient, you know, who we do not truly believe that these are curative therapies, they're suppressive therapies. Think about like insulin for diabetes. You don't suddenly wake up one day and go, I'm going to stop my insulin and see what happens then I don't, I don't usually stop it unless there are side effects or something like that. The stage three who had the chemo radiotherapy, so this is where it gets a little nuanced. The cure rate for chemo radiotherapy in stage three is not amazing. It's like 25%. I mean, you can find a number north or south of that if you like. And so the question is, is that a low enough chance of cure that you would want to view yourself as more likely to be not cured than cured, and therefore you would stay on the targeted therapy indefinitely, which I think was the initial question that was asked. And mm -hmm. I would be actually very receptive to that, again, depending on cost and toxicity and everything else. There's also, I think, a lot of fear for the patient, at least those that I've talked to, who have been on many years of a targeted therapy that are technically, at least based on scans, in remission or have no evidence of disease, there is that fear factor of if I come off, does yeah. that mean I'm going to either have to start over or could it be something completely different? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, if you have a huge copay or there's a lot of side effects, I think you can start to look at that. You can start to look at dose reductions and everything else. But generally speaking, I don't think we should forget the severity of the disease that we're talking about. Somebody said to me the other day, they went, oh, ALK, that's a really indolent form of lung cancer. And you go, no, it's not. It's actually super aggressive unless you're on therapy. Yeah. Yeah. But just because yeah. we've tamed a tiger, it's still a tiger. Agreed. Agreed. We've talked a lot about um, single therapies, you know, targeted therapies given as, as one drug. Um, yeah. Are there, uh, is that the most common or are there opportunities or options for combination therapies as well? There are two answers to this. So uh, generally speaking, in terms of targeted therapy, you, you start with one and you only bring in combinations in the setting where you develop acquired resistance and you have another pathway that's active. Um, and so if I give you an example, so um, MET gene amplification or turning on that MET pathway maybe a mechanism of acquired resistance in 10 to 15 percent of ALK patients when they progress on their ALK inhibitors and so you add a MET inhibitor into ALK for example. Um, so generally speaking you would start with a single one. The only way that's being shaken up a little bit is okay so now we're going right to the cutting edge. So if evolution of your cancer is just a numbers game you know if you have five cells trying to do the Rubik's cube or 50 billion cells trying to do the Rubik's cube. If you have 50 billion cells doing it, it's gonna take a short amount of time on average before they figure out a way to grow in the presence of the drug. So people have started to look at putting people on initial targeted therapy and then consolidating that at the point of maximum response. So you shrink it down with the target therapy and then can you push it even further? Can you shrink the number of cells surviving down even smaller so there's few things left to do the Rubik's cube? And so some people are looking at adding in a course of chemotherapy, like a retro move. Other people are looking at repeating a PET scan and saying, well, there's, you had 10 things glowing and now you have two things glowing, let's zap the remaining glowing things with radiotherapy. So that's kind that consolidation approach, which is kind of like combination therapy, is I think going to start to be explored. And I think 
it makes a certain inherent sense because again you're just trying to reduce the palette of diversity your cancer has to figure a way around your initial block yeah i do want to touch a little bit on um clinical trials because i know okay. that can be kind of a taboo or scary word for a lot of folks who are new to this sort of space and kind of think of it as their grandfather's, you know, clinical trial where they, they're going to be getting a sugar pill and they're just destined to die. So talk a little bit about. Uh... <laughs> Remind me not to employ you as a research coordinator. Um, so, yeah, I mean, honestly, so a clinical trial, let's, let's break it down. So a clinical trial is you're asking a question and you're trying to generate data to answer that question. Now, that in and of itself is neither a good nor a bad thing. You know, forget the idea of like all knowledge must be good. But in terms of for you, the decision as to whether a clinical trial is a good or a bad thing depends on the exact clinical trial. And you know, because we put it in one of the 360 degrees of hope, um, yeah. a little article, which is probably not even impressed now, but about the sort of questions you should ask. And one of the things that is, what would you do for me if I wasn't on the clinical trial? And if that sounds much better, you go, okay, dude, that's easy. You know, why are you going to put me in a trial that's randomized to yesterday's treatment or, you know, the year before yesterday's treatment when you would be something different? So there's that. You want to know if it's randomized. You want to know how many visits there are. You want to know if the treatment is there. What are the side effects? What do we know about whether it works? And, and forget the phase of the study. This is like how early the drug is in development. That doesn't matter. In the hands of an expert, a phase one study can be just as effective as a phase three study. It's just about you've got to trust the person who's there and trust that their motivation for offering you a clinical trial is to give you the best possible therapeutic outcome. If their motivation is because I like to put people on clinical trials, that's okay, but that's definitely kind of like the silver medal position, not the gold medal position. Yeah, I think that's great. And I know. A lot of folks do call in and GoTo also has a very um, amazing program. I, I've been patting GoTo on the back a little bit here towards the end of it, but it's called our Lung Match Program, and it's run through our science and research department, and it is a personalized sort of clinical trial matching service. So when folks call, we can help match them to trials that may be in their area that they can then go back and talk to their healthcare providers about um, if it's something that they're interested in, in participating in. And I think... You know, I don't think we give enough thanks to the folks who have come before this very conversation and have participated in clinical trials, because without them, we wouldn't have made all of the discoveries um, that we have, and we wouldn't have all the amazing therapeutics that we have. What are, uh, what are some of your final thoughts or any last minute things that you'd like to get out before we close that, um, that you hope our, our community kind of grabs onto and is the takeaway of the evening? So, so let me, you know, think about where the field is going. I mean, I think it's been a pretty amazing journey for 20 years expanding these group of things. And I think what we've done is we've gone from, you get a diagnosis of, of lung cancer and you don't have time to get your head around it. I mean, people 20 years ago, the, you know, their survival would be measured in weeks if, or, or a small number of months. Now for a significant proportion of people, you can go on a pill. It's going to work literally within days or weeks and it gives you time to get your head around it. But that's okay. We have to use that time, you know, for a personal level, you know, in your own life, but also it allows us to think about where do we want to go to next. For me, that's going to be how do we prolong control? So that's reducing diversity in the cancer. It's going to be about remembering that when you develop acquired resistance, it's not always in the same pathway. Second drivers are going to really come into their own. And I think my other favorite thing is the you know, we, we live in this kind of little box, but, um, you know, our brain actually has very different biology than the rest of our body. And I think in the future, we are going to see very different mechanisms of resistance and drugs in the brain than in the body. And again, the field is moving on to capture this data. It's always a work in progress. It could always be better, but that's okay. That's why we get up in the morning. I love it. And we are so grateful that you, that you do get up in the morning. Thank you so much, Ross, for, um, for coming and joining us tonight and having this fantastic discussion. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you watching tonight, to our patients, our caregivers, our community. You are who we do this for. Um, and I would, of course, be remiss in not thanking um, our supporters. So Amgen, AstraZeneca, Boehringer Ingelheim, Bristol Myers Squibb, Daichi Sankyo, Sai Foundation Medicine, Genentech, Merck, Marathi, Novartis, 
Regeneron Sanofi, and Takeda. You can tell by that that long list of, of supporters that there is um, um, a lot of faith and belief in, in this programming and the, and the amazing positions um, that we have come and speaking to you. So thank you all. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening and we will see you soon. Oh, I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. And it could be just you and me. We'll be family. Just wait and see.